The Labour leader, Sir Keir Starmer, praised the Queen as the best of us. Flags are flying at half-mast on government buildings. Political leaders from the UK nations have been remembering the Queen's years of service and her links to their countries. Politicians on both sides of the divide in Northern Ireland praised her for her efforts to advance peace and reconciliation. The First Minister of Wales, Mark Drakeford, said the Queen had firmly upheld the values and traditions of the British monarchy. The First Minister of Scotland, Nicola Sturgeon, hailed the Queen's dedication and devotion. Our Scotland editor, James Cook, sent this report from outside Balmoral Castle. Descended from Stuart kings and Scottish aristocracy, Elizabeth's roots in this nation ran deep. Within weeks of the coronation in 1953, the young Queen and her husband were touring Scotland. The welcome was warm, although her title, Elizabeth II, left some cold. She was, in fact, the first Elizabeth to rule Scotland. Eyebrows were also raised at her Silver Jubilee in 1977, when the Queen responded to Labour's plans to devolve power to Edinburgh and Cardiff by stressing the benefits which Union had conferred. And yet, two decades later, it was the Queen who opened the new Scottish Parliament, praising the national character of the Scots as she did so. From the Highland Games at Braemar to the coal mines of Fife, as the first monarch to visit Shetland since the Vikings, and the last to send great ships roaring into the Clyde. Elizabeth was a queen who embodied the union of the Scottish and English crowns. President Biden has described the queen as a monarch whose legacy will loom large in the pages of British history and in the story of our world. He used a speech at a Democratic Party event to pay this tribute to her. I just stopped by the British Embassy to sign the condolence book in her honour. I had the opportunity to meet her before she passed, and she was an incredibly gracious and decent woman. And the thoughts and prayers of the American people are with the people of the United Kingdom and the Commonwealth in their grief. The Commonwealth said it was mourning the death of the Queen with sorrow and sadness. Among its members, the constitutional monarchies of New Zealand and Australia have each been marking her death with flags at half-mast. She was head of state of the two countries and became the first reigning monarch to visit them both. From Sydney, Phil Mercer reports. The Queen had an affinity with Australia. On a tour in 2000, she said she felt part of a rugged, honest and creative land. She visited 16 times during her reign, travelling to every state and territory. The Prime Minister, Anthony Albanese, has recalled the sympathy and personal kindness she extended to Australians afflicted by tragedy and disaster, including floods and bushfires. In New Zealand, the Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern said her country wanted to share its thanks for an incredible woman who we were lucky enough to call our Queen. Later today, there'll be a gun salute at Parliament House in Canberra. There'll be one round for each year of the Queen's life. The BBC has announced that the last night of the proms has been cancelled as a mark of respect. The conclusion of the eight-week season was due to take place tomorrow. Railway staff and postal workers have called off their strike action. Many sporting fixtures have been postponed. There will be no play in the third test between England and South Africa at the Oval or Golf's PGA Championship at Wentworth. Today's horse racing has also been called off. A decision will be made later on this weekend's football matches. Small aspects of daily life will change in the early days of King Charles's reign. His portrait will replace the Queen's on newly minted coinage, and if tradition is followed, will face in the opposite direction. Postage stamps will also be updated. The words of the national anthem will change to God Save the King, and Charles's cipher is expected to be emblazoned on items such as police uniforms and new post boxes. Jane, thank you. It is uh, nine minutes past seven. It is the end of the second Elizabethan era. A moment of profound change for us all. A moment of personal sadness, but a moment too of national togetherness. A moment when people want to be together. And of course, one of the principal sites for that togetherness will be Buckingham Palace. And Martha is there. Yes, Justin, and it's still 
early in the morning, isn't it? But a sign of how many people see the palace as really being, well, synonymous with the Queen, the huge number of bouquets which have been left on the railings just across from us here in our temporary studio. We all have memories, don't we, of the, the crowds who thronged here so joyously to celebrate the Queen's Platinum Jubilee not so long ago in June and many people who come to celebrate royal decades over events over the decades and have come here now to mourn her. A friend of mine was just telling me about being taken to town for the Queen's coronation and camping out um, in Whitehall, um, a symbol of how many decades we have had the Queen, of course. Uh, the sound you can hear around me are other broadcasters from all over the world. They've come with their studios, a sign really of how her loss is being felt around the globe. Well, I'm joined here now by Robert Hardman, a journalist for the Daily Mail and author of mm. Queen of Our Times. Good morning. Good morning, Martha. We all have so many memories, but I know people who work at the BBC will remember very fondly when the Queen came to open our new building, <laughs> new broadcasting house. I was one of the presenters, take her to meet her, and she talked to us all and then went into the Today Programme studio and delivered a live broadcast absolutely <laughs> flawlessly and perfectly. But then, of course, she had been broadcasting since the age of 14. Well, that's right, Martha. I mean, she was the uh, most experienced broadcaster in the world. Uh, uh, her first broadcast at the height of the Blitz in 1940, alongside her sister Margaret, broadcasting uh, to the children uh, of Britain and the Commonwealth, uh, mainly aimed at evacuees, and uh, it was a it was a very powerful. I mean, to, to to this day, I mean, it still brings a lump to the throat listening to her doing that. And in fact, that particular broadcast was 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 then broadcast. You mentioned that the, the global. Um, uh, impact of all this and, and that, that broadcast was um, produced as a record in the United States and actually went on to be uh, perhaps the Queen's first hit uh, but then of course she, she's broadcast been broadcasting ever since um, and, and she referred back to that early broadcast mm -hmm. didn't she in the Covid yes. broadcast which meant so much again in one of our darkest hours as a country it is remarkable that, that you know at 14 she was um, really just reassuring the nation brilliantly in a time of crisis and there she was doing it all over again um, more, you know, 80 years later I mean and, and, and in between one thinks of uh, I mean there's, there's, there's Christmas broadcasts that have just been such a part of all our lives but also um, other broadcasts at, 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 at moments of great national importance one thinks of uh, you know the death of, of Diana Princess of Wales or the eve of the Gulf War um, but, but, you know, her voice has just sort of resonated, really, in, in, in all our lives um, over uh, all these years. And it's, it's going to be, you know, it, it, as, as, as the, the, the bulletin explained that, it's going to be a, 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 an extraordinary readjustment that, that we just don't hear that, that familiar, that very reassuring, um, very, uh, the, 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 the tones that just sort of assure you that, you know, everything's okay. You talked about the war and her broadcast with her sister Margaret during the war and of course that's when she herself signed up didn't mm. she for the ATS yeah I mean she she was the last head of state in the world today to wear uniform in the Second World War and when I was writing my book she she kindly let me look at her father's wartime diaries and I think when you when you want to understand her, you, you know, when you see what he went through in the war, it tells you so much about her approach just to life, to duty, to service. Um, how, whatever, uh, however gloomy the odds in front of you, you know, you, you, you have to get on with it. You know, duty calls. I mean, the old cliche, keep calm and carry on, but by goodness, I mean, that was her. And, and duty called for her so prematurely, didn't it? Yes, um, I mean, uh, she never expected um, to be to be queen um, uh, just a, a, as a 25-year-old mother of two, um, but uh, it, it was a, a huge shock to her. I mean, it must have been a comparable shock to what we're all feeling now. Uh, and, and she, of course, was one of the last to know because she was in, in Kenya at the time, but um, uh, not for one minute did she, did she sort of rip, flinch from that. I mean, I, I, it was very interesting. You go back through the years, uh, through whatever crises might come along at any time, um, one thing that comes through is she's never, she, she never panicked, she never rushed to judgment. She was 
uh, always uh, she 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 was very um, you know cool under fire as as a close friend of hers told me um you know she she followed her father's sort of naval um, adage in in times of trouble which this storm too shall pass uh, and and I think to have that sort of anchor, that sort of constant, particularly in, in turbulent times, um, I think it's really only now that, you know, we start to appreciate that properly. We certainly do. Robert Hardman, many thanks indeed for talking to us. Thank you. Martha, thank you. We will return to you uh, during the course of the programme, of course. Now, at uh, quarter past seven, the Queen was the most travelled monarch. She was... Uh, in part of that, of course, as well, the most connected monarch. She was connected to world leaders, to political leaders who came and went down the ages in far-flung nations, upon whom she made an indelible impression. We can talk now to Helen Clark, the former Prime Minister of New Zealand, who I'm delighted to say is on the line, and also Chief Emeka Anyauku, who is the former Commonwealth Secretary General as well. Good morning to you both. Um, Good morning. morning. Helen Clark first of all. When did you last meet the Queen? I, I last met the Queen when she visited the United Nations uh, when I was a UNDP administrator a, a few years ago. But as PM, my last substantive meeting with her was at Windsor Castle. She hosted this beautiful memorial service for Sir Edmund Hillary when the Garter was returned for the Order of the Garter. And then my husband and I had lunch with the Queen and Princess Anne at Windsor Castle. So that very special memories of that. And when you mention Windsor Castle, there are some amazing, uh, well, video, isn't there, that was taken some years ago of the Queen sort of moving between world leaders at Windsor Castle and, and greeting them all and making them feel at ease with each other. The breadth of her contacts around the world was, well, I mean, it was unique, wasn't it, for head of state? One of the things that became very clear to me when I first was able to have in-depth conversations with the Queen as Prime Minister, and I met her a number of occasions in that capacity, was that over her long reign, she had met so many leaders, uh, she'd been to so many places, Mm. she'd been briefed on so many issues that you could touch almost any button and the Queen would know about and talk about it. She'd either met a leader, she'd met their father, she'd met their children, she'd been to their country. She was incredibly well informed and that made her a very interesting person to speak with. What happens now to the relationship, the broader relationship between New Zealand and, and, and the UK? So New Zealand now is in a, a period of mourning as, as the United Kingdom and, and countries throughout the Commonwealth. Uh, in due course, uh, we would expect, I hope, to see King Charles come to New Zealand in that capacity. He's been a regular visitor as Prince of Wales. I wouldn't anticipate any early move on New Zealand changing constitutional status. It's quite complicated in New Zealand to do that the particular relationship with indigenous people with whom the the treaty establishing New Zealand was signed. It it would it, it's not something that, that's going to be tackled, I would say, anywhere in the near future. Chief uh, Annika uh, Anyaoko, if I could turn to you and first your personal thoughts about her and your personal memories. Um, The Queen was an exceptional leader and exceptional head of the Commonwealth uh, who met with uh, Commonwealth leaders in audiences in which she showed great wisdom and she was hugely respected and with huge affection by Commonwealth heads of government. At uh, whom he she met at meetings of uh, Commonwealth heads of government. Chief, what happens to the Commonwealth now? Well, the Commonwealth, I'm sure, will go on uh, under the headship of uh, King Charles the uh, Third. The Queen was much loved, as I said, by heads of government. Uh, an example of uh, that uh, uh, affection and respect was that when the Queen and Prince Philip celebrated their 50th wedding anniversary, the heads of government joined in making a personal gift 
of uh, construction of the Tresillion at the Windsor uh, Castle, which was then being refurbished after the fire, mm -hmm. and also two magnificent paintings of Oriole, Bird, and the Peacock. These were presented to the Queen and Prince Philip as a mark of the huge affection in which they were held by heads of government. So I expect that the Commonwealth will continue to flourish on, under the headship of King Charles III. Of course, as you allude to, the, the affection went both ways, didn't it? The Queen also felt that enormous personal affection for the Commonwealth. Are you saying that if the new king feels the same affection, then it will be reflected back in, in exactly the same way. Oh, indeed. I mean, the Queen was uh, greatly dedicated to the Commonwealth, and uh, I'm sure that uh, King Charles will follow in the same uh, uh, line, because already he knows and has met with a number, not all of them, uh, with Commonwealth heads of government, but in due course, I'm sure he will want to do so, and they will reciprocate the same respect and affection. Helen Clark, what do you think the future of the Commonwealth is now? I think the Queen saw the Commonwealth very much as the legacy of her father and she committed herself wholly to it. Uh, of course, over the years, discussion began about what will happen to the head of the Commonwealth position when the Queen uh, departs, as, 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 as she, at one stage she had to depart uh, life. So she made her wishes very clear in London, the last Commonwealth summit she, she hosted and attended, that she wished the Prince of Wales to step up as King and Head of the Commonwealth and the Commonwealth leaders ac accepted that and I think that was a sign of the great respect that he had for her, uh, th that they had for her. Now Prince Charles as he was, now King Charles has also travelled very widely in the Commonwealth and I think it will be a priority for him also to be out and, and about you know, renewing the ties in his, his new capacity so I would hope that as the Chief says, uh, the Commonwealth will continue to go from strength to strength and uh, King Charles will bring his own touch to it. And just to bring it back finally to New Zealand, uh, Helen Clark, w we are beginning the most extraordinary period in, in our history here in the UK. Things will be done and said that we haven't seen done or said in our uh, lifetimes, and certainly not our recent lifetimes. What, 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 um, how will New Zealand treat all of this and I'm not talking about necessarily at a ceremonial level but just in terms of ordinary people so for, for people of, of my age you know the post-war baby boomers uh, the Queen has been you know a, a constant figure almost throughout our entire lives uh, for younger generations uh, not so engaged perhaps more engaged with younger royals uh, through social media and, and perhaps you know, modern media and communications have given uh, the monarchy you know, more of a life, and, and, and generally in a positive sense, uh, than would have been possible otherwise. I think New Zealanders will will reflect on this, but New Zealand isn't a place that that will rush into change of a core element of its constitution, and it may be that even if it has a reflection, it decides that. You know, this is not the time, maybe there'll be a future time. I, I think there will be a future time, but I'm not sure it's just around the corner. Helen Clark, former Prime Minister of New Zealand, Chief uh, Amica Anya Oku as well, former Commonwealth Secretary General. Thank you both. Time now is 23 minutes past seven. The job of being monarch inevitably involved repressing Elizabeth's views, to some extent even her personality. So in recent years, we're all lucky enough to get a sense of the mischief, the humour, the joy that she got from her role in public life. Most famously, during the Olympics and the Jubilee. Good evening, Spot. Good evening, Your Majesty. Thank you for having me. I do hope you're having a lovely jubilee. Tea? Oh, yes, please. Mm. Oh, 
Perhaps you would like a marmalade sandwich. I always eat one for emergencies. So do I. I keep mine in here. Oh. For later. Paddington there, there with the cheers of the crowd as they were watching the Queen visiting Paddington for tea. And before that, of course, James Bond. It's, it's curious what makes you emotional when listening to that. That was the most emotional I have felt. That moment, which I guess connects your childhood to this moment of loss with Her Majesty, with the Queen, and the, and the joy of seeing her play that game, take part in that national party that was so joyful. Back and the year. human connection, too, when Martha was reading out the messages that have already been left at Buckingham Palace, personal messages from people addressing the Queen personally, mm. because that's something we all felt we could do. Felt a relationship with, which is particularly striking, when in a sense we knew so little and yet knew so much. We'll obviously be reflecting on that over the next few hours. The program we're on air till 10 o'clock this morning. We'll be looking ahead as well to the reign of King Charles III. Um, the time now is 25 minutes past seven. And let us turn to the weather. A breezy day, further sharp showers for many, longer spells of rain. Uh, in the north. Something rather glorious about those rainbows, weren't there? Over Buckingham Palace and over... We Wind can't Kansas promise rainbows yeah. again today. Yeah, yeah, that can, cannot be guaranteed. You're listening to Today on BBC Radio 4 with Justin Webb and Nick Robinson. Jane Steele now has a summary of the news. A period of mourning has begun across the UK following the death of Queen Elizabeth II. She died yesterday at Balmoral Castle in Aberdeenshire at the age of 96, ending a seven-decade reign. Gun salutes and church bells will ring out across Britain today as the nation remembers the longest serving monarch in its history. The new king, Charles III, has said the death of his mother was a moment of great sadness for him and his family. He's expected to meet the Prime Minister Liz Truss in London later, where he will hold meetings to confirm plans for the Queen's funeral. The king is also due to make a broadcast address to the nation. The Queen's death has prompted an outpouring of affection from presidents, prime ministers and religious leaders. The 13th and final American president to meet her, Joe Biden, said she was a source of comfort and pride for generations of Britons. President Putin of Russia said the Queen rightfully enjoyed the love and respect of her subjects as well as authority on the world stage, while Pope Francis paid tribute to her life of unstinting service. Landmarks, including the Eiffel Tower and the London Eye, went dark overnight as a mark of respect to the Queen. Planned strike action by rail and postal workers has been called off in the wake of her death. A walkout next Thursday and Saturday by the RMT union has been suspended. The Communication Workers' Union won't go ahead with a 48-hour strike that was due to start today. The BBC has announced that tomorrow's last night of the proms has been cancelled as a mark of respect. Sporting fixtures, including cricket, golf and horse racing, have also been called off. A decision will be made later on this weekend's football matches. Jane, thank you. 27 minutes past seven is the time. King Charles III. We know him on many subjects. We know what he thinks. But of course, we do not know how he will reign. Let us focus for some moments now on the man and the role. In 2017, Prince Harry interviewed his father for this programme and asked which issue was at the top of his agenda. If you could pick one issue to focus on in 2018, so this coming year, what would it be? I mean, there's all sorts of issues that you could choose, but I think you and I would probably both choose well, I mean, the same thing. you know, because so it probably bores you to tears for so many years. I mean, there's a whole lot of things I've tried to focus on over the over all these years that I felt needed attention. Mm -hmm. Not everybody else did, but maybe now, some years later, they're beginning to realize that what I was trying to say may not have been quite as dotty as they thought. But, mm -hmm. I mean, the issue really that has to go on being focused on big time, I think, is, is this one around the whole issue of climate change, which, mm -hmm. you know, now, now, whether we like it or not, is the biggest threat multiplier we face because what's happening now is what i was dreading which is that we're having to deal all the time with the symptoms that are springing up all around the world mm -hmm. and which is divert they're diverting us off down all these different channels to try and deal with ghastly conflicts and humanitarian and natural disasters and goodness knows what else mm -hmm. 
but at the root of it all much of it is is climate change which is causing untold horrors in different parts of the world and was the king talking in 2017 last year the then prince of wales made a passionate plea for a more sustainable approach to farming putting nature back at the heart of the equation our current approach is forcing many small family farms to the wall if they go it will quite simply rip the heart out of the British countryside and break the backbone of Britain's rural communities. So if we want to have food that is healthy and produced in a sustainable way, we must support a diversity of farms that help them make the profound and rapid change the crisis demands. Prince Charles as was now King Charles III. Let's turn to two people who know the man well to talk about both the man and the role that he now fills. Dame Julia Cleverton is in the studio with us, ran one of the Prince's major charities business in the community for 20 years and was advisor, special advisor on the Prince's Charities, a collective of all the charities he founded in that role. Rory Stewart joins us as well. You know him as the former Conservative Cabinet Minister, maybe rather less so, uh, as the tutor to the young Princes William and Harry, chosen for the job by Prince Charles himself. Good morning to you both. Good morning. Good morning. Dame Julia, first of all, the curiosity, isn't it, of this day, of all days for Prince Charles, is he spent years thinking about this moment, what it means for him, what he will do with it, what to say, and how the transition will go. Do you get a sense of how he wants to be our monarch? Well, King Charles, I suppose, has had a model in his mother of such unswerving duty, commitment, faith, service to others. And much of the last 50 years of the role that he played as the Prince of Wales uh, illustrated that service to others, which I think he learned and saw so clearly in her. You traveled round the country with him, I know, with the work that he was doing on business in the community in particular, it was service of a different sort though, wasn't it? It was also service in the causes that he believed in, as we were hearing. Well, I think I did indeed. I mean, he travelled the country, travelled the world, travelled the Commonwealth. He could not have worked harder or with more dedication and commitment and interest to the people he met. He, I think, has a very, very great ability, as the Queen had, to talk to people, to listen, to understand, and to care about what they said and how they said it. And I remember an extraordinary experience 10 years ago when he had brought all his charities and others together in Burnley, and the Queen came with the Duke of Edinburgh, to listen to what had happened in Burnley in that incredibly impressive and fascinating town of bringing together all the charities and the leaders and the businesses and so on and so forth. And she said then how impressed she was with the leadership and interest of the Prince of Wales in encouraging and enthusing communities to come together to improve their neighbourhoods, their towns, their cities and their countryside. Let me bring Rory Stewart in if I could. Is it a problem, Rory, that we, we all think we know him? It's very different from the Queen who grew into that role from a very early age. He is becoming monarch at a much, much older age. We think we know him, we think we have our views formed of him. Is that a problem? It's certainly very different, isn't it? Um, but, but following on from what Julia was saying, I. I Seeing him in action, having seen him as a, a, a when I was 18, but also in Afghanistan, where he was incredibly um, compassionate, engaged with Afghan craftsmen. I, I remember him spending, you know, an hour and a half just listening to people's stories during the Afghan evacuations, writing handwritten letters to check that people were okay in Cumbria during the floods the way that he spent time with people. I mean, I think maybe, in other words, to answer your question, maybe what we don't see enough in the media is what he's like one-to-one. -one. He has the most, I, I think, really you know, 
compassion, charisma, thoughtfulness, and and I think it's that that I hope is going to come out more. Mm. And there is an opportunity, is there, Rory, or does the nature of the role, the need to repress views, make that rather hard to do? So I think uh, His Majesty the King is very our new king is very, very aware of the difference between being the king and being the Prince of Wales, and that he would have to uh, approach the role in a very different way. And I think he's seen his life always in two halves. He wanted to make the most use that he could of being Prince of Wales, particularly driving his charities forward. Passionate about the environment, passionate about, as you say, nature, farming, traditional crafts. But I think as king, of course, he has a very different set of responsibilities, and he really understands that. He is now a head of state with all that that means in terms of I suppose producing enduring um, leadership and dignity I and mean, one of the, the miracles of the system that we have is that it allows us prime ministers to come and go and we don't have the political controversies that many many other countries face around their president but the royal family provide a degree of stability in an age which often feels very unstable. Dame Julie you were nodding at that suggestion that he knows the difference between then and now, between the role of Prince of Wales and the role of being monarch? My experience of the uh, of King Charles when he was the Prince of Wales is that he was immensely clear about what he could and should do as the Prince of Wales, preparing for, I mean, probably I take it will be the best prepared king that we have ever had in terms of understanding our nation uh, and working with it but that when the time came as they used to be said when the boss moves up the street that seemed to be the sort of chat that it would be a very very different role and he had as his model uh, a queen who for 70 years uh, you, you said earlier there was an element of mischief, of humour and of joy in her. And that is the same, in my experience, for our king. He has great joy, great humour, great interest, fantastic mimic, just as the queen was, and can see always both the seriousness of the issue, but also, in some cases, the... <laughs> the humour of this. The absurdity as well. Rory, you mentioned those letters sent to people he met. Of course, he sent letters to ministers to you, I imagine, when you were a minister as well, spelling out how uh, passionately you felt about certain issues. I, I mean, I think, it's, I think that's a, a good thing to ask. But again, to return to Julia's point, I think he's very, very clear about the fact that as king, he has a very different constitutional role. Mm. And I think has thought very hard about how to approach that. So I think we'll find a very different approach as King because as the Prince of Wales, he was really a social entrepreneur. He was actually leading debates on environment and climate. He was campaigning for issues he believed passionately about. But, but there may be people listening, forgive me, Rory, who are not uh, yeah. trying to cause problems by asking about this, but who want him to play that sort of convening role, global convening role on an issue like climate change. Are you saying just sadly the transition means that's not really possible and the things that over the years we've heard about different attitudes to faith, for example, uh, the honours system we were told about, even taught that he'd moved the base of the royal family from Buckingham Palace to Windsor. You're not suggesting, are you, that none of this is, is possible? I think the transition will make a huge change and I think the King is very, very aware that his role now is to embody a whole nation and that he will go through a transition that will be quite striking for people would be my, my guess. I mean, obviously this is, I can't really speak for His Majesty, I'm not in any position to do that, but my sense, having spoken to him about this many years, like Julia, is that he's very, very aware that he's now taking a very different role where he will embody the country and that that will mean that he will no longer be able to do many of the things he did as Prince of Wales. And the last brief word from you both, if it were, there are plenty of people listening, I think, are anxious. Anxious that the Queen, who's held the country together for so long, held countries together across the United Kingdom, is irreplaceable, not because King Charles is not, as it were, up to the role, but that nobody can do it. Julia, do you think that's uh, he is aware of the scale of that challenge? 
I'm absolutely clear that the king is totally aware of the scale of the challenge mm. and 50 years preparing for this role means I think that you know you can say every work of art is a child of its time and the very fact that her first Prime Minister was born in 1874 and his first Prime Minister uh, will is of a, a different era means that of course as some of the clips you used about the things that he believes are really important for the world. He, I believe, in his understanding both of the Commonwealth and of the challenges that face us across the world, he will play a different role, but he will absolutely understand and has learnt at the feet of a, probably the greatest queen we've ever mm. going to have. Final word to you, Rory? Yeah, so I think um, people will, I hope, feel as, as Julia and I and anybody, I mean, I think he's interacted with hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of British people over the last decades, and I think people who dealt with him closely have been so struck by his compassion, his courtesy, his energy, his interest in things, and I think we're very, very lucky to have him as king, and I think this is a, actually is, is a wonderful, it's a very sad moment for the United Kingdom, but I think we're, it could also be a very wonderful wonderful rain ahead. Rory Stewart, Dame Julia Cleverton, thank you very much indeed. For those of you wondering, when was our new Prime Minister born? 1975. Mm -hmm. 1874, my goodness, another country, uh, to put it mildly. That extraordinary fact, which uh, really can't be repeated often enough, and is picked up on in quite a few of the papers, which we turn to at 22.8. And actually, the conversation that uh, we've just been having also picked up on in the Times. What kind of king is uh, Charles III going to be? They ask in one of their headlines, and they go through the points we just had made as advisers have argued is too aware of the constitution too sensitive to the requirements of his role to do anything that would cause constitutional problems he is passionate and driven one said but uh, he does have a deep respect and understanding of the constitution and of the role of the institution of the monarchy in national life he won't do anything that would threaten the edifice uh, and then also they quote his own words his own words actually in a bbc documentary he was asked if his campaigning would continue when he was king and this was his reply no it won't I'm not that stupid I do realize that it is a separate exercise being sovereign so of course I understand entirely how I should operate in the Guardian their political commentator Martin Kettle picks up the themes we were discussing there do not underestimate he writes the upheaval in British life that this dynastic moment will trigger Elizabeth II spent 70 years as a low-key but extremely effective unifying force in a nation that is visibly pulling itself apart her passing will remove that force which her heirs cannot assume they'll be able to replicate in its way this succession will be one of the biggest tests to to face modern Britain. Politics, he writes, needs to be involved. On a happier note, in the Times they report that the clergyman who spent last weekend with the Queen reported that she'd been full of fun and the life and soul of things. 18 minutes to 8. So much of our national focus now is going to be on the obvious places, on Windsor Castle, on Buckingham Palace, on the Palace of Westminster. But, well, people everywhere will be involved and will want to be involved, not just in personal reflections, but on coming together as well. Let us uh, talk to Simon Cowling, who's the Dean of Wakefield Cathedral, and to Joe Rotner as well, who's the Lord Lieutenant of North Yorkshire. Good morning to you both. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Simon Cowling, first of all, uh, what are you planning? So, today the cathedral will be open from 10 o'clock after our early service of morning prayer, and we'll be offering people uh, the opportunity to light candles, to sign our book of condolence, to take away prayer cards, um, and to reflect on the momentous events of the past 24 hours. Uh, to reflect and to come together? Yes, I think one of the great gifts that cathedrals and churches give to the nation is space, uh, most obviously physical space. Uh, but also I think something else, and that is emotional and spiritual space, um, which is a curious combination of both intimacy um, and space. And uh, it's a great gift, as I say, to people 
of whatever faith or of no faith, because all of us uh, will feel uh, Her Majesty's death keenly. And Joe Rotner, uh, North Yorkshire, rural area, not so easy always physically to come together. What, what are you planning? What is being planned? Well, again, as um, the bishop said, we've got, um, we have two um, cathedrals, um, York Minster and Ripon Cathedral. Um, both had evening compliance um, last night, and um, I think that was the beginning of people coming together. But as you say, it's an incredibly rural area, and um, I think we, North Yorkshire, will be in full mourning, and we will stand alongside the nation. Um, she was, as everybody has said, remarkable, and um, for that point, people will have an outpouring of grief. They will find their books of condolences in many of the county halls. There will be places where they can put their floral tributes, and um, there will obviously be um, the uh, tolling of a muffled bell in Ripon and York from 12 noon for an hour. And of course, we shouldn't forget the role of broadcasting in, in, in all of this, the role of the BBC and other broadcasters in, in allowing people to come together who can't actually physically be together for, for whatever reason, Joe Robner. And you think of, of, well, quite a few people in North Yorkshire who might just not be able to get to events that they'd like to get to, but will be able to see it, experience it uh, on television and radio. Yes, I think we saw um, North Yorkshire's strength in our communities um, over the last few years. And um, we've, everybody up here obviously absolutely um, adores, adored the Queen. And I think that our communities will come out um, together and uh, make sure that everybody is included in, in mourning for her. Because uh, I think it is some, at this time we all want to stand together rather than, as you say, be um, on your own um, just mourning because there is something about having a crowd of people. And, and the point as well, which so many newspaper columnists have made to, today, Simon Cowling, and it is so true that it, it is a moment of, of national mourning, but a lot of people actually just will be personally upset. Personally upset and affected. Um, I've been reflecting um, over the past few hours on the Queen's visit to Wakefield Cathedral in 2005 when she distributed the Maundy. And there are still stories one hears about that day uh, and the extent to which the Queen made it a personal event for everyone who was there. Even though they might not have exchanged a single word with her, um, she had that extraordinary ability to connect with people, um, which was, I think, one of the most significant features of her, of her reign. I wonder how many people will come to your cathedral today who do not normally come, indeed possibly have never come before. I think uh, many people will come and uh, wait for cathedrals in the centre of the city and it's a space which is open to everyone and we look forward to welcoming people um, throughout the day and at a special service of Eaton Song. Uh, tonight. I think if I may just add one thing. Mm. Um, in her, in the last years of her reign, the Queen, the Queen spoke very often about her personal faith in a way which um, I think enabled people of all faiths in the country um, to understand the importance of um, faith in the life of the nation. Uh, and that ability to connect across communities of faith, I think, is another significant legacy of her reign. Simon Carling, Dean of Wakefield Cathedral, Joe Rockner as well, Lord Lieutenant of North Yorkshire. Thank you both. It is now 12 minutes to 8, and time for thought for the day. The speaker this morning, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby. What a life. What an extraordinary life. And yet the death of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II is a shock to our sense of permanence and because of her long and steadfast reign, which helped us make sense of who we are as a nation. It was a reign that was not only for the United Kingdom. It was a reign that was for the whole world. Around the world, in the work I do, I hear so many people who spoke of her not as anything other than the Queen. She showed us permanence. She gave us a sense that life wouldn't change. And so, with her death, 
we feel that permanence is rocked. And for many of us, it is almost impossible to imagine a world without her. For all those who yesterday found themselves bereaved in their own families or from their own friends because many other people died yesterday, they will know especially that sense of great loss, of uncertainty, the loss of identity, the fading of what seemed permanent. But that is the lie of death. For Her Late Majesty showed us that when we build our lives on God's faithfulness, we are on the solid ground of eternity that cannot be shaken. In Coventry Cathedral hangs a tapestry called Christ in Glory. It is an image of Christ after his death and resurrection and ascension, but with the wounds of the cross. It's 80 foot high and between his feet is an almost life-sized human figure. That figure can't see Jesus. That figure is looking out from between the feet, can only see the mark of the nails in the feet. They are vulnerable, exposed, unprotected, but they are sheltered by the Christ they cannot see. In time of grief, fear, or vulnerability, we cling to the wounded feet of Christ. It is offered to all of us. We look out into the world and can find that our lives can be abundant as her late majesty's was. That our lives can find hope even in the face of death. We remember today especially the royal family in their grief. We pray for the reign of his majesty King Charles III. He will feel especially the weight of this change. In the Christian story of life, death and resurrection, there is space for our grief and uncertainty. We see the wounds of Christ who died with us. But with God, the final words are abundant life and fulfilled hope. And in Her Majesty's life, we saw that and can be inspired. That was Thought for the Day with the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby. And we'll be hearing more from him after 8 o'clock, along with the former Prime Minister, Theresa May. The time now, 9 minutes to 8. We are looking ahead this morning to the days before us and to the change that the nation will experience. But we're also, of course, looking back and looking back with affection, unbridled affection for a woman whose views on world affairs were kept private and discreet, but whose interests, whose passions we know very well. Here is the Queen talking about her love of horses for a 1974 documentary, The Queen's Horses, A Personal View. My philosophy about racing is simple. I enjoy breeding a horse that is faster than other people's. But I suppose basically I love horses. And recently I've been trying to inject a bit more speed while keeping the same families or lines. <laughs> Let's talk to Claire Balding, the broadcaster, who is on the line. Good morning to you, Claire. Good morning. She did indeed love horses, no question about that. Yes, and actually even just yesterday her very last runner was at, was at Epsom and it, it was very poignant seeing those royal colours go out onto the course and as always in racing things don't go to plan. The filly hit the front, looked like she was going to win easily and then got beaten on the line and it's the unpredictability I think of racing that the Queen so enjoyed. She loved racing people, she loved the chat, she loved being in the yards. I filmed at Sandringham Stud and, and saw her with a, a mare and foal that had only been recently born. She had a natural way with horses and I think they in many ways responded to her calmness, her dignity and her appreciation of them. Yeah, it, th that sort of sense of her understanding of them, I've seen it referred to before and, and there then a, a affection for her or, or understanding as animals that she cared for them. I, I've always felt that, that animals reflect your true personality, you know, they don't, they don't know your status and if, as the Queen always was, you're kind and patient and consistent, they will respond to you uh, in a positive way and if you're impatient or unkind equally, they will get scared mm. and therefore react badly. I, I also ought to mention I, I've hugely 
enjoyed and it makes me smile the memory of of the queen with her Pembrokeshire corgis and the yeah, fact that yeah. she had chosen a breed that was so wonderfully naughty and and i do think there's that side of racing as well that i think the queen enjoyed it, it was the you know she she liked the the chat as well as the sport itself but my word she knew an awful lot i mean generations of horses breeding that you know went way back an understanding of repeated patterns of behavior and and so much joy i mean when estimate won the gold cup at, at royal ascot that really was something to to see it was yeah. just lovely because that's the point when you talk about horses in the plural yes she did love horses in the plural but she actually also loved individual horses and knew about individual horses and knew them uh, absolutely, and and funnily enough, through, throughout her her life and her her breeding, she had a particular um, affinity with fillies. She had some very good fillies as as estimate, and now a mare standing at Sandringham Stud, having foals of her own. But Carozza and High Clear and Dunfern and just some of the really good, high achieving fillies that that were bred and owned by by the Queen. But I tell you, she she was so good at dealing with things when they went wrong. I mean, even very early on, Oriole was her first runner in the derby. And obviously there was a great deal of excitement and it, this was not long after the coronation and she had inherited the horse from King George VI. And he was beaten by Pinza. And Pinza was ridden by Sir Gordon Richards who had taken 28 years to win the derby. And instead of saying anything negative about the fact that she'd been beaten, she just said, that's wonderful for Gordon. <laughs> Tell us about Monty Roberts, a horse whisperer. Yeah, this is really interesting because the Queen was also fascinated by how you could um, influence the behaviour of horses from a very <clears throat> young age. And she had come across the work of Monty Roberts, and he was an American... He was the original horse whisperer. He was the one that the film with Robert Redford was based on. And he used a technique called join-up, which was about communication with a horse and how you got them to follow you rather than it, it was all about cooperation and teamwork and the queen flew monty roberts over from america and he worked with her young horses for a number of years but he trained her stud staff and also um the the grooms that worked with her yearlings at pole hampton which is um just on the hampshire Berkshire border where the young horses mm. would be taken trained okay. them to do join up Claire, um, I'm going to pause what you're saying there, if I may, because I think we have Nikki Henderson on the line, who was, um, well, the Queen's primary jumps trainer um, uh, from 2002 onwards. Nikki Henderson, hello, can you hear me? Hello. Yes, hello, Nikki Henderson, I think you can good. hear me now. I just yeah, wanted to, we've just been reflecting on the Queen's love of horses and, and love of yeah. individual horses. She was also a lover of racing, uh, and, and racing has lost someone who was, well, it's, 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 it's greatest patron, I suppose it's fair to say. The greatest patron and its greatest friend, really. Um, raised in world. And outside. Oh no, it what sounds... Sort of the, Nicky yeah, Henderson, I'm the, sorry, the, but it sounds as if the line to you has, has failed. We heard you say uh, greatest patron and greatest friend, and I think that is going to have to be it because the line is not going to be uh, successful. But Nikki Henderson, thank you so much for trying to get through to us. And Claire Balding, thanks a lot for what uh, you've told us as well. It's three minutes to eight. The weather seemed to be sending its own message yesterday, didn't it? Dreadful downpours, heavy downpours as the news got grimmer. And then, then a rainbow over Windsor Castle, a rainbow over Buckingham Palace. What has it got in store for us today? Helen Willett can tell us. Nick, thank you. Good morning. Yes, the same area of low pressure that was with us yesterday is overhead again today. So it will be a day of sunny spells and scattered heavy, slow-moving showers. The fog is now starting to lift but it's been pretty dense around the wash up into the northeast of England in particular. As I start the detail with England and Wales, we do have a few areas of really quite persistent rain, not even showers. That's northeastern England and coming into parts of Wales and the southwest. And those areas will probably be quite wet for much of the morning and into the afternoon. Elsewhere, I think we will see some sunshine to continue between those scattered showers and uh, most places seeing a shower or two at least through the day. Temperatures only about 14 in the rain but up to 20, 21 as yesterday in the sunshine. That same area of rain across Wales moving into the southwest has also been affecting Northern Ireland overnight. That's easing now. So brighter skies and a scattering of showers and highs of around 19 again. 
Now, as we move to Scotland, we've got some really quite persistent rain still across southern and eastern areas. It'll brighten from the north as the day goes on. We've had a little bit of patchy fog around, but I think fewest showers northwest Highlands region, so 20 here, but 14 with the rain in the south and east. Helen, thank you. A word now from Victoria Derbyshire, who presents tonight's Any Questions? Tonight, clearly a very different programme to the one we had originally planned. We'll be in London with a panel to reflect on the life of Queen Elizabeth II, the major events of her lifetime, the evolution of the Commonwealth and her legacy. Any questions? Tonight from 8 and tomorrow lunchtime from 10 past 1 here on BBC Radio 4. Coming up in the next hour of the programme, we'll ask how history will look back at the second Elizabethan age. We'll speak to the former Prime Minister, Theresa May, and the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, about Her Majesty's life and her legacy as well. We'll do something that we're determined to do throughout this programme. We're on air till 10 o'clock this morning. We'll also hear clips of Her Majesty herself over the years from the archives, the moments we cherish and remember. You're listening to Today on Radio 4 with Nick Robinson and Justin Webb. It's 8 o'clock on Friday the 9th of September. The headlines this morning. The new King, Charles III, is preparing to return to London following the death of the Queen at Balmoral. He'll address the nation this evening. Bells will be rung across the UK at midday as the country begins a period of national mourning. Commonwealth leaders have been remembering the Queen and her devotion to the organisation. The BBC News had read this morning by Jane Steele. Gun salutes and church bells will sound out across the UK as the country begins a period of mourning for the Queen, who died yesterday at the age of 96 at Balmoral in Aberdeenshire. She was Britain's longest-serving monarch and celebrated her Platinum Jubilee earlier this year. King Charles III led the tributes to his mother, saying he knew her loss would be felt across the country, the Commonwealth, and by many people around the world. After spending the night at Balmoral, the King is due to return to London and will address the nation this evening. Here's our Royal Correspondent, Johnny Diamond. The first day of the reign of King Charles III has begun. A day of mourning and reflection for the late Queen. A day of long-planned ceremony and a day when the new monarch takes his place within the machinery of state. The king will travel with the queen consort to London. The prime minister will have an audience with his majesty later in the day. At midday, bells will ring out from Windsor, from Westminster Abbey and St Paul's Cathedral, and from churches across the nation in remembrance of the 96 years of the late queen's life. Then will come the military, in London's Hyde Park and at the Tower, in Belfast, Cardiff and Edinburgh, and at other saluting stations in Britain and abroad, guns will fire in salute. In the evening, the King is expected to address the nation, and after that, a service of thanksgiving and reflection will be held in London. For the King and for the nation, this is a day like no other, a day when decades of service are remembered, when a Queen is mourned, and when a new reign begins to be established. Buckingham Palace has become the main focus of mourning. Black cab drivers decided to pay their respects last night by lining up along the Mall. Crowds have gathered in front of the palace with people turning up throughout the night to lay flowers at the gate, despite the at times heavy rain. Our reporter Tim Muffet has been speaking to some of those who made the journey. The mood in front of Buckingham Palace has been sombre and respectful. Thousands of people have been remembering the Queen, many in tears. Flowers have been laid by the railings, often accompanied by messages of condolence and words of thanks for her years of dedication and duty. These people explained how they felt. It's heartbreaking, absolutely heartbreaking. What did she mean to you? The Queen means everything to me like my mum means to me. She was a fantastic lady. She'll always be a part of my life forever. She meant a lot to me. Um, for some of my age, I've got quite old grandparents. They were born in the 1917 and 22, so she was part of their lives too. So it feels very strange to have this person that's been the head of everything in my life go. Many have been saying how shocked they were by the Queen's death, even though she was 96 and had been suffering with mobility issues. The sadness that is so widely felt is mixed with a desire to recognise and honour 
the Queen's extraordinary 70-year reign. At other royal residences, too, mourners have come to pay their respects and lay flowers. This woman at Windsor Castle explained why she felt the Queen's loss so keenly. She's like everyone's grandmother, really. Um, the constant that's always been there. Um, I think everyone's going to be feeling like they've lost a member of their family, really. Um, she's done some incredible work for this country and we'll forever be grateful for her. There's nobody like her in the world. And in nearby Windsor itself, these people said the Queen had been part of their life. It's just hit me. It really has, and I think it's going to hit everybody in this town, but not only here, all over the world. You know, she was a grandmother, she was a mum. She's part of my life, she's part of my mum's life, my late father's life. She was such a special lady. Like, she was so lovely and so cute and so warm. And um, I think she just won everyone's heart. Like, even with my daughter, she said, I really want her to live to 100. The Queen's state funeral is expected to take place at Westminster Abbey within a fortnight. Before then, her coffin will lie in state in Westminster Hall, allowing members of the public to file past. At Westminster, both Houses of Parliament will sit today so that MPs and peers can pay their own tributes to the Queen. Yesterday, the Prime Minister Liz Truss described her as the rock on which modern Britain was built. The Labour leader, Sir Keir Starmer, praised the Queen as the best of us. Flags are flying at half-mast on government buildings. Political leaders from the UK nations have been remembering the Queen's years of service. The First Minister of Scotland, Nicola Sturgeon, hailed the Queen's dedication and devotion. Politicians on both sides of the divide in Northern Ireland praised her for her efforts to advance peace and reconciliation. The First Minister of Wales, Mark Drakeford, said Queen Elizabeth had firmly upheld the values and traditions of the British monarchy, as our correspondent Hal Griffith reports from Cardiff. Outside the Senedd, the flags of the Welsh Parliament are at half-mast, and flowers have been laid as people pay their tributes to the Queen. Her relationship with Wales stretched back to her first visit as a young princess, but it was defined by the events of 1966 and the Aberfan mine disaster, in which 116 children and 28 adults lost their lives. At first hesitant to travel to the village, she then visited repeatedly over the course of several decades to meet the survivors and support the community. In recent years, the focus of royal visits switched to the Senate as it grew in power and responsibility. The First Minister, Mark Drakeford, has led tributes by saying she will be sorely missed by all the organisations in Wales she championed and supported over many decades. The US President Joe Biden described the Queen as an incredibly gracious and decent woman. He said her legacy would loom large in the pages of British history as well as in the story of our world. He added that the thoughts and prayers of the American people were with the UK and the Commonwealth. The Commonwealth said it was mourning the death of the Queen with sorrow and sadness. Several members of the association in Africa gained their independence from Britain during her reign, and leaders across the continent were quick to pay tribute to her. Our Africa correspondent Catherine Biarahanga sent this report. South Africa's President Sir Ramaphosa remembered in a statement his meeting with the Queen in 2018 in London when the two looked over letters Nelson Mandela had written to her. The Queen and Mr Mandela shared a close friendship. Malawi's President Lazarus Chakwera looked back on the Queen's visit to his country in 1979 when he was 24, saying she captivated the imagination of Malawians. In Ghana, flags will fly at half-mast for seven days in memory of the Queen. The country's president, Nana Akufo Addo, praised her stewardship of the Commonwealth, saying she oversaw the transformation of the Union. Part of that change included welcoming new members that were not former British colonies like Gabon earlier this year. Its president, Ali Bongo, tweeted, the Queen was a great friend of Africa and Africa showed her affection in return. Turn. The BBC has announced that the last night of the proms has been cancelled as a mark of respect. The conclusion of the eight-week season was due to take place tomorrow. Railway staff and postal workers have called off their strike action. Many sporting fixtures have been postponed. There will be no play in the third test between England and South Africa at the Oval or Golf's PGA Championship at Wentworth. Today's horse racing has also been called off. A decision will be made later on this weekend's football matches. 
As King Charles III begins his first full day in his new role, the country begins to wonder what his reign will look like. Our royal correspondent Nicholas Witchell, who spent many years reporting on the royal family, reflects on this changing of the guard. No monarch has been older at the moment of their accession or waited for longer to fulfil their destiny than Charles. He's made a point of never anticipating this moment publicly other than to offer an assurance at the time of his 70th birthday that he fully understood the constraints that must necessarily apply to a monarch as opposed to an heir to the throne. The new king will lead the nation's mourning for his mother. He will know how deeply she was respected and he will be only too well aware that anti-monarchist groups, whether within the United Kingdom or in some of the other countries of which the British monarch is head of state, will be hoping to exploit this moment to try to press their case. The death of Elizabeth II will leave a considerable void in public life. She was sure-footed as a constitutional monarch and widely revered for the example she set throughout her long reign. King Charles III will want to reassure the country that his reign will continue to be a focus for the stability and unity which were such hallmarks of the reign of Elizabeth II. Nicholas Witchell reporting. Thank you, Jane. It is coming up to ten past eight. We wake this morning to a country changed, a country saddened, a country that has lost a defining part of who and what we are. In Queen Elizabeth, we had a monarch who was not just our monarch. She was the glue that often held us together. Now, she had to repress her personality. She had to repress, often, her views to carry out that job. But there was, throughout her 70 years in office, her 70 years that spanned the first Prime Minister, Winston Churchill, born in 1874, to her 15th, who she appointed just a couple of days ago, Liz Truss, born a century later in 1974. They were the people, the Prime Ministers, who got some sense of Her Majesty's knowledge, her interests and her views. In a moment we'll be talking to one of them, to Theresa May. Let's first hear the words of Sir John Major, who spoke on Radio 4 last night. There are so many recollections and in many ways so different from what people might imagine. The private meetings that the Prime Minister has with the Queen, which are perhaps scheduled for 45 minutes, in my experience never lasted uh, uh, remotely under an hour and often some way beyond it, which weren't entirely serious matters, just discussing the, uh, the matters of the nation. There was a great deal of amusement in them, there was a great deal of humour in them, there was a bit of gossip in them. And apart from that, the serious matters that were discussed, I think people would have been extraordinarily surprised if they realised the depth of information the Queen had about the lives of people uh, in every conceivable part of the United Kingdom. She was always extraordinarily well briefed. And on foreign affairs, of course, uh, she would often say if there was a difficulty of a foreign leader, well, I met him many years ago, or even I knew his father. There was always a wise word to be had. And those meetings with the Queen were one of the better parts of a Prime Minister's week. There's a smile on the face of Theresa May hearing that. One of the better parts of the week. Is that how you regarded your audiences with Her Majesty? Well, yes, and, and it's a tremendous privilege as Prime Minister to be able to have those audiences of, of Her Majesty. And I'm sitting here, and I guess like so many people across the country, thinking this was a time that we had always hoped would never happen. And adjusting to a sense, because the only monarch I've ever knew until last night was Her Majesty, and adjusting to that, that realisation that she is no longer there. But those audiences were conversations. Officially it's called an audience, but it was a conversation. And as uh, John Major has just said, it was a conversation with somebody who was immensely knowledgeable, who did her red boxes, who read the, the, her papers, who knew what was going on, who'd had that tremendous experience over the years of her reign, who knew, as he said, many of the world leaders. Um, and I always say it was that m one meeting a prime minister went into when they knew that nothing that was said was going to be briefed to the press or <laughs> leaked afterwards. And you're certainly not going to brief us or leak us, leak to us. But, but give us a sense of the 
type of conversation you could have. Presumably, it therefore was much more than you simply saying, well, Your Majesty, I'm planning to table the third reading of, and she says, ah, how interesting, what else have you got? You were talking about the affairs of the day. Talking about the affairs of the day, um, in a sense, tapping into her wisdom and her and that knowledge that she had from her great experience the knowledge she had of people a lot of the people that the prime minister would be uh, that i was dealing with that any prime minister would be uh, would be dealing with um but there was also you know general conversations uh, uh, parts of the conversation as well as a as a berkshire mp obviously we know her majesty's love of windsor um so there would be sometimes talk about local issues was she able to give you little portraits of the people that you would meet as prime minister, people that she may have known for, for years, even decades, who you were relatively new to. I, she was a very uh, acute judge of people. <laughs> and uh, she... Uh, I'm only laughing because I'm looking at your face. You're choosing your words diplomatically and carefully. Did she occasionally say the odd barbed waspish no, thing she, about she this? She was a very, that? very uh, acute judge of people yeah. and was able often to give those little if you like, pen portraits of, of people that she knew, that she'd met. Um, and sometimes it was a case of not just the individual, but actually a, a sort of history of, of that individual, of, of her experiences of, uh, of particular countries and particular issues. Now, the humour that you talk about for many years, decades really, I think the public didn't see that unless they were lucky enough to meet her one-to-one. -one. It was only in later years through that lovely audio we heard earlier of James Bond at the Olympics or Paddington Bear this year uh, at the Jubilee. But the, the humour, the mischief almost was always present, was it? Oh, it was. There was often that twinkle in the eye and that magnificent smile that would uh, that would break out and that, that uh, you know, calmed so many people's nerves and, and made so many people feel at ease. And there was always that, that sense of humour. And I, if you think about it, what other world leader would be willing to do, you know, be seen coming down on parachute <laughs> <laughs> from a helicopter into <laughs> London 2012 yeah. or sit there watching Paddington Bear drinking tea from the teapot? Well, years ago, people, of course, would have thought it diminished the role in some sense, but she proved extraordinarily modernised, and not a phrase I suspect she would like very much, but she was, wasn't she? Well, I think if you think over 70 years, life around her and the, the, the world that she was living in uh, changed so much, and she was very adroit at adapting through those years. And I think that, uh, that sense of fun, that recognition, that actually showing that other side perhaps of, of herself actually was important as well now some listening to you will nod along indeed agree to everything you've said but that makes them worry they think that a thread that existed between if you like the wartime generation that she grew up in and was introduced to the nation during that time and the world we live in now that transition if you like from the era of the wireless to the era of the smartphone from social deference to egalitarianism they will worry without that glue if you like represented in the symbol of the monarch that these are difficult and dangerous times for the country well of course queen elizabeth had that wide range of experience and had served in uniform during the Second World War. So there is a difference, of course, when a new monarch comes, uh, comes to the throne. But the great strength of our constitution is that a new, new monarch does come to the throne and does so immediately. Very difficult for that individual, I think, to take on that responsibility immediately in that way, at the same time that King Charles, of course, is mourning the loss of his mother. But the continuity of our monarchy, I think, is our great strength. And I think that should give people that confidence and reassurance. Yes, the experience is different. Yes, it is a different individual. But it is our constitutional monarchy. And that thread continues. Can I pick up on what you were saying ab about how the world changed around her and around us? That there's been a statement overnight from Paul Keating uh, the former Australian Prime Minister, a Republican, of course, but enormously warm about Her Majesty, and, and saying this, that she understood 
and attached herself to the public good against what she recognized as a tidal wave of private interest and private reward, and she did it for a lifetime. Do, do you sort of recognize that in her, that she could see around her not just change in the sense of history carrying on, but actually changes in the way that people behave towards each other? Oh, absolutely, and I think one of the immense strengths and, and remarkable um, aspects of, of Queen Elizabeth II was she had an incredible understanding of her people. Um, you know, people think of the monarch as this sort of slightly high and mighty person who's, who's divorced from, from the people, but because of the, the way in which she involved herself in understanding what was going on in the country, in looking at letters, you know, she couldn't look at every letter she received, from, uh, from members of the public, but I understand she would always look at some of those letters just to understand how people were feeling. And actually, remember, you know, she was until uh, latterly out and about at events. She was learning about people's lives. She was learning about their communities. So I think what was critical was she had that deep understanding of the people and she recognized some of the issues that people were having to deal with as they were going through this this changing world around them. Now this is not a day for politics, but inevitably a monarch has a wider role in a country we choose as a nation to have a monarch in that way rather than an elected head of state. There are worries that others have that given the divisions in the nation, whether it was over Brexit, they still go on, whether it's the divisions about the existence of the United Kingdom, whether Scotland should be independent, whether Ireland should be reunited, that a figure who didn't need to say anything but represented the whole has now gone and that that will be of consequence. Well, of course we're seeing a, a transition to a new reign, but remember in a sense the figure that didn't need to say anything the figure uh, that represents the unity of the country is still there in the monarch king charles is now that figure and uh, i think that's the other great strength of the monarchy that it will unite us we've seen that already in the great outpourings of grief at the loss of queen elizabeth uh, people coming together um you know from all sorts of uh, part, all parts of the country, all sorts of backgrounds, but absolutely united in grief. And I think you will see that unity in support for the new monarch. Theresa May, thank you very much for taking the time to come into the studio. Thank you. Well, one of the things uh, we knew about the Queen was the importance of her religious faith. So it was a personal connection with faith that was all who knew her said absolutely central to her. But it was. More than personal, of course, as with every aspect of her life, there was a formal side to it. She had, of course, a formal role at the head of the Church of England. She was the supreme governor, a role she thought about and wanted to explain in her own terms. In a speech she made right at the start of her Diamond Jubilee year, back in 2012, she described the Church of England as an umbrella under which other faiths could shelter. Here at Lambeth Palace, we should remind ourselves of the significant position of the Church of England in our nation's life. The concept of our established church is occasionally misunderstood and I believe commonly underappreciated. Its role is not to defend Anglicanism to the exclusion of other religions. Instead, the church has a duty to protect the free practice of all faiths in this country. It certainly provides an identity and spiritual dimension for its own many adherents. But also, gently and assuredly, the Church of England has created an environment for other faith communities, and indeed people of no faith, to live freely. That was the Queen speaking back in 2012. Let us talk now to the Archbishop of Canterbury, to Justin Welby, who is on the line. Good morning, Archbishop. Good morning, Justin. And we can assume what she said there will be felt, in fact, we know it is felt, don't we, enormously by the new king. It is felt very deeply indeed by the new king and lived out by His Majesty during his enormously long time as Prince of Wales. And um, I think that speech of the Queen's at Lambeth in 2012 was 
utterly inspirational. It uh, is one that we go back to very, very frequently. And uh, I'm sure that the Prince of Wales at the time agreed with what she said, and His Majesty will carry that on. Did, did, carry it on in the sense that he will develop it as an idea, do you believe? Yes, it's... Um, I remember hearing the Duke of Edinburgh on one occasion um, in an interview being asked a question about himself and he said, it, it's not about me. And in one sense what the Queen was saying at the time in 2012 was, it's not about us Anglicans, we're, we're there for others, as she said, to be a, an umbrella for faith. And uh, that is very much the attitude of His Majesty the King. Um, he will continue to encourage this sense of being there for everyone, of looking outwards, of welcoming all, and doing so without condition. Can I put to you the, the, the comments from Paul Keating uh, overnight that, mm. that I put to Theresa May? Because they are fascinating uh, in the sense that he takes on, he's, he's paid tribute to her, warm tribute to her, but he's also paid tribute to what he suggests is her recognizing of a change in the way that private lives, public lives actually, have been, have been lived during the period she was monarch. He calls it a tidal wave of private interest and private reward, and she fought against it, instinctively attached herself to the public good against that. Did you recognize that in her? I recognize that invariably and absolutely. It was in her own attitude of service that said it's not about me it's about what I have been called in as she would have said as or thought what I have been called by God to do as she recognized from her coronation onwards um, but it was also um, a sense that the nation and indeed the world and the Commonwealth will hold together when uh, there is that standing against private interest where the common good is what matters. And she lived that out herself. Um, his Majesty has lived it out in his life, and His Royal Highness Duke of Edinburgh lived it out in his. I think it's a constant in the way monarchy acts, because that is what they're called to, and that is what they recognize. And it, in both His Majesty and her late Majesty's lives, that comes out of... Obviously, the loss of... Uh of Her Majesty the Queen is being felt most strongly, I think, in the Unionist community, but there's no doubt that Queen Elizabeth II commanded uh, respect from all communities in Northern Ireland in a way that really very few, if any, pu public figures have uh, done before. Sir Geoffrey Donaldson, the leader of the Ulster Unionist Party, said she had been a, a steadfast and unshakable head of state, but at the other end of the spectrum, so to speak, Sinn Féin's Michelle O'Neill, the Vice President of Sinn Féin, in line to be First Minister at Stormont once the political crisis there is resolved, she said that she'd learned of the Queen's passing with deep regret and that she personally valued the Queen's work for reconciliation across these islands. And of course, people here are thinking of two events in particular in that context. One is the Queen's uh, state visit to the Republic of Ireland in 2011, the first ever uh, by a British monarch since Irish independence uh, 101 years ago now, uh, a visit laden uh, with historic uh, symbolism. And then the following year, a historic handshake between the Queen and the late Martin McGuinness, a former IRA commander who'd become, as a Sinn Féin politician, the Deputy First Minister in the power sharing the role of government. And on both occasions, people were particularly conscious of the fact that the troubles in Northern Ireland had touched the Queen in a very personal way in 1979 when her cousin, Lord Mountbatten, uh, was murdered by the IRA and her gestures. Um, as I say, uh, in 2011 and then in 2012, uh, and her, her personal history, her personal suffering during the conflict here uh, made those peacemaking gestures all the more relevant, all the more powerful and all the more remarkable. Our Ireland correspondent Chris Page at 23 minutes to seven.
Let's turn to the newspapers. There is, of course, no point in telling you what's on the front pages. You know what's on the front pages. Tributes to Her Majesty. Photographs. Some beautiful photographs. Very struck by the one on the front page of the FT that has chosen to go for a smiling one, capturing the mischief, the humour of the Queen. Photographed at the state opening in 1971. Reams of words written. Let's just give you little samples. The Sun editorial is striking, I think. A light has gone out on our lives. It says the day Britain and much of the world dreaded is upon us. She is gone. The mother of our nation, the most famous, most loved, most respected woman on earth, the longest reigning monarch in our history, Britain's backbone. The sun goes on, the one constant, the one source of stability for us. All throughout eight decades of tumult and change, unimaginable to the world of 1952 when she came to the throne. Our head of state, our queen. In The Guardian, uh, Gabby Hinscliffe, its uh, columnist, has written a column that begins, Stop all the clocks, cut off the telephone. For once, she says, the opening lines of W.H. Auden's poem, Funeral Blues, seem to fit the moment. And there are some really striking columns in a range of papers. There's a wonderful headline in the Daily Telegraph uh, across Alison Pearson's piece. The headline reading, There was a sense that as long as she was there, things would somehow be... All right, and that's the theme that Alison Pearson then takes up in her piece. Did, she, did we come to believe she was immortal, Alison Pearson asks. I think we probably did in some weird way, because losing something that permanent is impossible for the mind to comprehend, like the moon going out or the stars packing up, was a sense never articulated that as long as the Queen was there, things would somehow be all right. And that's a theme... Um, added to as well by Jonathan Friedland uh, in The Guardian who says that um, longevity plays strange tricks and it was of course the longevity of the Queen the fact that she was there for so many of the occasions that there have been in this country um, ranging right back as he puts it to black and white television gentlemen in hats lions corner houses uh, that country and this country, he points out, would barely recognise each other, and yet the one thing they have had in common was her. Jonathan Friedland there writing in The Guardian. It is uh, 21 minutes to seven now. The first public sign of concerns about the health of the Queen came when notes could be seen being passed along the government and opposition front benches in a packed House of Commons at around 12 o'clock yesterday, the new Prime Minister, Liz Truss, was unveiling the first and perhaps the most important policy of her premiership, a multi-billion pound package to curb soaring energy prices. With her look at yesterday in Parliament, here is our parliamentary correspondent, Susan Hume. All summer there's been an intense clamour to know what else the new Prime Minister will do to help people with energy bills. But now that Liz Truss was finally ready to unveil her plans, the occasion was immediately overshadowed by concern about the Queen. Just after midday, there was a sudden flurry of toing and froing in the chamber between Cabinet Ministers and the Prime Minister, the Labour Leader and the Speaker. Sir Lindsay Hoyle was shown a message and got to his feet. I wish to say something about the announcement which has just been made about Her Majesty. I know I speak on behalf of the entire House when I say that we send our best, best wishes to Her Majesty the Queen and that she and the Royal Family are in our thoughts and prayers at this moment. Well, shortly before that news that the Queen was unwell, the Prime Minister Liz Truss laid out her plans to help with the rising cost of living. She said she was honouring her promise and introducing an energy price guarantee, which she said would save the typical household £1,000 a year. It will curb inflation and boost growth. This guarantee, which includes a temporary suspension of green levies, means that from the 1st of October, a typical household will pay no more than £2,500 per year for each of the next two years while we get the energy market back on track. Yeah. Now Liz Truss chose to make her announcement in a speech rather than in a question and answer session. That meant any MP who wanted to press her on her plans had to try to interrupt. 
Opposition MPs didn't have much luck in catching her eye, but she did allow the Lib Dem leader, Sir Ed Davian. He didn't think she'd offered enough. Her announcement today will still see the energy bills of struggling families rising by another £500 next month. And this winter, they will be paying energy bills twice the bills that they paid last winter. The Prime Minister reminded him that her offer was on top of help already announced. She brushed away lots of attempts by opposition MPs to question her about the proposals. So there was the inevitable outcry when a fifth Conservative, Steve Bryan, was allowed to intervene. Very kind of the Prime Minister to give way to so many sensible members. Today is clearly a, a big intervention and the government is, as she promised, wrapping its arms around my constituents. But who will pay for that help? Well, Liz Truss said the Chancellor would set it all out later this month and she repeated her intention to boost domestic supply to ease prices. But she still didn't agree with Sir Keir Starmer about getting the energy producers who are making extra profits from high wholesale prices to shell out more. We will not be giving in to the leader of the opposition who calls, who calls for this to be funded through a windfall tax. That would undermine the national interest by discouraging the very investment we need to secure homegrown energy supplies. The Labour leader was pleased she'd announced help this winter. They dismissed our call for support as handouts. Yeah. Yeah. But those objections could never last. The Prime Minister had no choice. No government can stand by while millions of families fall into poverty, whilst businesses shut their doors and the economy falls to ruin. Yeah. So I am pleased there is action today. But Sir Keir Starmer argued that her determination not to extend the windfall tax on the big profits of oil companies was simply dogma. The head of BP has called this crisis a cash machine for his company yeah. Yeah. and households are on the other end of that cash machine, their bills funding these eye-watering profits. Yeah. That's why we've been calling for a windfall tax since January yeah. Yeah. and it's why we want to see the windfall tax expanded now. And he said there was no evidence that taxing profits made as a result of Russia's aggression in Ukraine would deter investment in new energy sources. Not long after, Liz Truss and Keir Starmer both hurried out of the chamber to respond to the sombre news about the Queen. And that was Susan Hume reporting on yesterday in Parliament. The time is 16 minutes to 7 and our headline this morning is that gun salutes are going to be fired across the UK and across the world to mark the death of the Queen. Charles III will start his first full day as King, meeting the Prime Minister and addressing the nation. Now, throughout this morning's programme, we'll hear not just from our correspondents and those paying tribute to the Queen, but also from the archives. Elizabeth was, of course, not born to be Queen. It was not until she was 10 years old that she became first in line to the throne after the abdication of Edward VIII and the accession of her father, King George VI. From that moment, she prepared for the life of duty ahead. In a radio broadcast from Cape Town, the 21-year-old Princess Elizabeth dedicated her life to the service of the Commonwealth. If we all go forward together, with an unwavering faith, a high courage and a quiet heart, we shall be able to make of this ancient commonwealth, which we all love so dearly, an even grander thing, more free, more prosperous, more happy, and a more powerful influence for good in the world than it has been in the greatest days of our forefathers. To accomplish that, we must give nothing less than the whole of ourselves. There is a motto which has been borne by many of my ancestors, a noble motto, I serve. Those words were an inspiration to many bygone heirs to the throne when they made their knightly dedication as they came to manhood. I cannot do quite as they did, but through the inventions of science, I can do what was not possible for any of them. I can make my solemn act of dedication with a whole empire listening. I should like to make that dedication now. It is very simple. I declare before you all 
that my whole life, whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service and the service of our great imperial family to which we all belong. But I shall not have the strength to carry out this resolution alone unless you join in it with me as I now invite you to do. I know that your support will be unfailingly given. God help me to make good my vow and God bless all of you who are willing to share in it. Well, we'll reflect on the Queen's role as head of the Commonwealth a little bit later on with the ex-Prime Minister of New Zealand, Helen Clark. And it was striking, wasn't it, just hearing the change in accent, the change in language. Yeah. It really just reminded you of the vast length of Her Majesty's time on the throne and the huge change in the country. And as so many people have said over the past 24 hours, the one thing that seemed unchanging was her. And we'll be hearing her voice during the course of the whole program, which goes on this morning until 10 o'clock. Let us talk, though, at 12 minutes to 7, a bit more about the formal side of what happens now. And let us do it with David Leakey, who is a former Black Rod, uh, and Hannah White, who's acting director of the Institute of Government. Good morning to you both. Good morning. Um, Good morning. David Leakey, first of all, what, what does happen? What happens in the Houses of, of Parliament? What can we expect to see? So the, the general outline of the next uh, 10 days or so is that the, the Queen's body will be brought to London by train or air um, in the next days. On day five, uh, and le let me say this is not certain because it does depend on a number of factors, mm. um, but roughly on day five, the Queen's body will be uh, taken in um, a procession to Westminster Hall in the Palace of Westminster, the Palace of Westminster being the Houses of Parliament, um, and will be the, the coffin will be set up on a catafalque in the middle of Westminster Hall, uh, received in the ceremony by members of the royal family, um, and the Archbishop of Canterbury will conduct a very short service. Um, after that, peers and MPs from uh, the Houses of Parliament will uh, file past and pay their respects. Um, and shortly after that, uh, Westminster Hall will be open to the public and members of the public can pay their respects um, as they process through Westminster Hall. And there will be very elaborate arrangements of how the members of the public can join the queue to do that, uh, made public in the next uh, few days. And then on day 10, uh, roughly on day 10, uh, then uh, will be the state funeral which will take place in Westminster Abbey. So that's the general outline. Uh, and David, there is also, isn't there, we, we know that the King is already the King. King Charles is King Charles the third. But yes. there is a formal side, isn't there, as well, to his accession? There, there are uh, two parts to this. Um, and the main part is a declaration uh, of the King, uh, which will take place either today uh, or tomorrow uh, at a meeting of the Privy Council in St. James's Palace, normally in St. James's Palace, after which um, uh, the uh, Garter King of Arms, a, a ceremonial post, will make an announcement from the balcony of St. James's Palace. And that will be, if you like, the formal declaration of the King um, having acceded to the throne. Uh, uh, the throne passes automatically on the death of the sovereign um, and the coronation, uh, which will be the formal, um, as it were, coronation of the king, uh, may not take place for some months or even as it uh, was in 19, uh, when, when the, uh, the queen took the throne, um, it, there was a period of about, I think, 14 or 15 months between her accession and the coronation date itself. There's a striking d difference, isn't there, Hannah White, between what happens in front of house, as it were, those formal things that we all see and take part in, and the way that the Constitution works behind the scenes. Yes, that's right. I mean, I think most people's vision of, of the monarch is, is very much, uh, you know, what is happening in public, but the monarch also has a role uh, in government and behind the scenes. and. and as David was saying, those responsibilities will, will have passed directly on to King Charles on the death of his mother. 
but there is also um, a, a side, and I think we also pick this up from what David was saying, a, a sort of flexibility, isn't there, as well, about our institutions and about the way we we put these things together because there is there are things that are still to be decided and will be decided based on what presumably the new king wants to happen and what seems to be right at the time that's absolutely right i mean a great deal of planning um has gone into uh, the next period and you know mu much much has been agreed and much will have been discussed with uh, with the late queen but there is always flexibility and there must be flexibility uh, to take account of the circumstances and you know we are in in, in particular circumstances for example the, the fact that the Queen was in Scotland uh, when she died um, and where we are in terms of, uh, of the new government indeed mm -hmm. just being in, in the process of formation. How much David Leakey will uh, the new King have to engage now with the people behind the scenes with everyone in order to get done what he wants done in other words how much of this will be how much of the organization will be personal to him um, well the, the king in many sense will hold the whip hand on this um, the person who um, traditionally is responsible for state ceremonial such as the state opening of parliament or a state funeral in this case um, is the Earl Marshal, the Duke of Norfolk and he is uh, the titular head of ceremonial for such state occasions but there is um, a great teamwork so the, the King will set um, uh, if you like the style and nature of the ceremonies which can be changed there is an enormous plan called London Bridge which is the plan for all the uh, administrative and ceremonial arrangements and security arrangements around the death of the Queen and her lying in state in Westminster Hall and the state funeral itself. Um, but that plan is an outline plan, huge amount of detail in it, but the details and even the outline, the dates of when the state funeral is, um, are, are, are changeable. But that plan will be made between the government um, and the royal household. Mm -hmm. David Leakey, former Black Rod, Hannah White, acting director of the Institute for Government. Thank you both very much. It is now six minutes to seven. Well, as we were hearing, everything that happens over the next ten days of mourning has been meticulously planned. I mean, many people listening now, I think, who will want to know what they should look out for later in the day, in the days to come, what they should listen to on Radio 4 or watch on BBC television. So let's join our royal correspondent, Johnny Diamond. What, what do we expect to take place today, Johnny? Well, today we'll, we'll see a, a combination of what you might describe as a state machinery um, as the new king and the queen consort travel to London. Um, an audience is expected um, where the prime minister will um, meet his majesty and um, the king is expected to address the nation in the early evening. Uh, and I, I suppose you could say that is about the establishment of the new reign and the establishment of, as the king, as, as the new monarch. Um, and then there will be the ceremonials uh, around the mourning and remembrance of the late queen um and i suppose the the, the most um the most noticeable will be the ringing of bells first of all at midday at westminster abbey at windsor at st paul's cathedral and then at, at churches as they so choose across the country um and then of course the military of which the queen was the commander-in-chief will be heard from very loudly um, uh, again in London a gun salute at the Tower of London and in Hyde Park uh, in Belfast, Cardiff and in Edinburgh at what are called saluting stations other saluting stations in Britain that's generally military installations and at British military installations and other places around the world uh, and, and that will be uh, at one o'clock uh, and again that figure of 96 for the years of the life of the late Queen uh, 
will figure very largely in the gun salute. Uh, and then later in the evening, um, the first religious service, a service of thanksgiving and reflection, which we understand, uh, we expect the Prime Minister to attend, but not the King, um, will take place in London. Do we know the, the route of the coffin, the opportunities people will have to pay their respects? No, I mean, the, 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 the details of that are not yet released, um, but there will be, I think, as much opportunity for people as possible to pay their respects to the Queen. Um, and I, I would be very surprised if there was not a, a long period of lying in state as well as there was uh, with the late Queen's father, King George VI. And Johnny, just a word about King Charles III. We'll have many opportunities to talk more about it in the days to come. We'll be talking to those you know him well later in the programme as well. Do you have a sense from the palace of how he will want to introduce himself as their new monarch? I think you will hear a lot of reflection about his his late mother, um, about the Queen, um, and a, a reflection of the mourning of the country. Um, so this will not be a, 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 a sort of a political manifesto or even a, a sort of sovereign's manifesto looking forward when we first hear from the King. It will be very much trying to reflect and, and gauge, understand and channel uh, the mourning of the country uh, and of course uh, the mourning for his mother Johnny Diamond, our Royal Correspondent thank you. Two minutes to seven is the time to the weather and Helen Willits Justin, thank you. Low pressure this week has brought a lot of showers longer spells of rain, it's still overhead with us today, it will then drift away eastwards to allow drier weather for the weekend, but light winds in places means we're dawning to patchy fog this morning and now we're into September, that will take until about 9 o'clock to clear. So for England and Wales, picking out some detail, that fog's around through the Midlands, East Wales, the Vale of York and around the Wash. But then sunny spells will follow here once it clears. However, we have got some areas of quite persistent and heavy rain, notably across the north and west of Wales and northeastern England. But for the rest of England and Wales, it will be once again a day of sunny spells and scattered heavy showers, slow moving at times as well, away from the breezy south. Temperatures on a par with yesterday between 17 and 21 degrees Celsius. Northern Ireland are seeing the northern, the overnight rain starting to ease. Still a bit of cloud around, so that will gradually break up, as will the mist and fog clear. But uh, so too, scattered showers will follow through the day, a high of around 19 degrees. For Scotland, we still have that heavy rain, persistent rain across eastern areas, becoming more confined to the southeast as we head into the afternoon. So elsewhere, broken clouds, sunny spells and scattered showers, but we do have some fog to clear in the northwest highlands. 14 today in the rain but as high as 20 where the sun shines in the northwest. Thank you very much indeed, Helen. In the next hour of the programme, we'll hear from leaders who dealt with Her Majesty, the artist who painted her portrait, those who shared her love of horses as well, and we'll ask what type of king we can expect King Charles III to be. You're listening to Today on BBC Radio 4 with Nick Robinson and with Justin Webb. It's seven o'clock on Friday the 9th of September. The headlines this morning, the UK is beginning the first day of mourning and reflection following the death of the Queen at Balmoral at the end of her 70 year reign. The new King, Charles III, will travel to London where he'll meet the Prime Minister and address the nation this evening. Crowds have gathered at Buckingham Palace with people turning up throughout the night to lay flowers. The BBC News is read this morning by Jane Steele. Gun salutes and church bells will sound out across the UK as the country begins a period of mourning for the Queen, who died yesterday at the age of 96 at Balmoral in Aberdeenshire. She was Britain's longest serving monarch and celebrated her platinum jubilee earlier this year. King Charles III led the tributes to his mother, saying he knew her loss would be felt across the country, the Commonwealth and by many people around the world. After spending the night at Balmoral, the King is due to return to London and will address the nation this evening. Here's our Royal Correspondent, Johnny Diamond. The first day of the reign of King Charles III has begun. A day of mourning and reflection for the late Queen. A day of long planned ceremony and a day when the new monarch takes his place within the machinery of state. The King will travel with the Queen Consort to London. 
the Prime Minister will have an audience with His Majesty later in the day. At midday, bells will ring out from Windsor, from Westminster Abbey and St Paul's Cathedral and from churches across the nation in remembrance of the 96 years of the late Queen's life. Then will come the military in London's Hyde Park and at the Tower, in Belfast, Cardiff and Edinburgh and at other saluting stations in Britain and abroad, guns will fire in salute. In the evening, the King is expected to address the nation and after that, a service of thanksgiving and reflection will be held in London. For the King and for the nation, this is a day like no other, a day when decades of service are remembered, when a Queen is mourned and when a new reign begins to be established. Buckingham Palace has become the main focus of mourning. Black cab drivers decided to pay their respects last night by lining up along the Mall. Even in the early hours, people were still gathering in front of the palace to lay flowers at the gate and remember the Queen. Radio 4's Paddy O'Connell spent last night there and describes the mood. At the palace gates was the scent of lilies in the damp. All around there was good humour mixed with tears, bobbing umbrellas and rain. The youngest at times outnumbered the oldest, some scaling the Victoria Memorial with flags and flowers. That's exactly what happened in 1945 when Princess Elizabeth slipped into the crowds at exactly the same spot. Small groups around me sang or clapped. Larger crowds will gather in the days ahead and with them clues perhaps about who they and who we all are. We British do nostalgia like no one else and many there told me that with the death of the Queen the country seemed easier to understand in the rearview mirror.